Good morning, and welcome to worship at the Pleasant Street United Methodist Church. My name is Bernie Campbell, and it's my pleasure to be the worship leader this morning. Um, before we begin our service, we have a couple of announcements we'd like to make. First and foremost is that Pleasant Street United Methodist Church hopes to resume in-person worship a week from today, that is September 13, 2020, at 9 a.m., here in the Call Hall Fellowship Hall. A letter has gone out from the reopening committee, which hopefully you have received by now, which details the protocols for how we will gather together in worship and seek to do our utmost to keep everyone safe and healthy during this pandemic. If you have not received that letter, or if by chance you tossed it out with all the election mail that came to your home, Please call the church office at 603-898-2501 and we will endeavor to get you new copies of the letter and the enclosure. One of the enclosures is very important is the screening questionnaire which is in the packet which we ask you to fill out and turn in as you arrive for worship. Um, it is a questionnaire having to do with COVID-19. Um, it is part of the protocols that the real community has established. You will be asked to fill out one of these forms every time you arrive for worship. You will have a large number of blank forms available on Sunday to take with you, bring with you for future worship. Um, and we thank you for doing your part to keep everyone safe. So we, we look forward to uh, live worship. If you still prefer uh, to uh, join us through the live stream video, we will be continuing that ministry uh, indefinitely and perhaps permanently if we can uh, arrange it. We've invested quite a bit of time and effort. My son has invested a significant time and effort to set up the video system that we have in place. And uh, we thank Bernie William and his family for allowing him the time to come and participate in that ministry. So if you are so willing, please come and join us next Sunday morning at 9 a.m. And if not, continue to join us online. Um, this coming Saturday, uh, please join in a bike ride off the rail trail. Plan to meet with a group from St. Luke's who will be biking down from Derry. Details of the timing and contact will follow by an email, uh, perhaps also posted on our church website, um, pleasantstreetumc.org. Um, and so if you wish to uh, find that on our website, watch for an announcement posted there. Finally, a reminder that if you have an, a tithe or an offering or a gift you'd like to make to the Pleasant Street United Methodist Church, you may do so by sending your check to the church at Pleasant Street UMC, 8 Pleasant Street, Salem, New Hampshire, 03079. If there are no other announcements, we are going to begin this morning with an opening prayer. Our opening prayer is taken from Psalm 119, verses 33 to 40. Teach us, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and we will observe it to the end. Give us understanding that we may keep your law and observe it with our whole hearts. Lead us in the path of your commandments, for we delight in it. Turn our hearts to your decrees and not to selfish gain. Turn our eyes from looking at vanities. Give us life in your ways. Confirm to your servants your promise, which is for those who fear you. Turn away the disgrace that we dread, for your ordinances are good. See, we have longed for your precepts. In your righteousness, give us life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture readings this morning, the first one is taken from the epistles, Paul's letter to the church and believers in Rome, Romans 13, verses 8 through 14. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this sentence, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling the law. Besides this, you know what hour it is, how it is full time now for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves becomingly as in the day, not reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery or licentiousness, not in quarreling or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 15 to 20, reproving another who sins. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of this, his holy word. And now I invite our pastor, Ben Daggett, to share his morning message. Thank you, Bernie. And thank you, Bernie. And thank you, Sally and Diane, for all your support in getting our online worship together as well. Everyone working behind the scenes. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. God is love. God is perfect love. Love your neighbor as yourself. We have heard these words, some of us, so many times that maybe they have lost the sheer force of their significance. But to rest with them, wrestle with them, really marinate in them, is to marvel at how revolutionary and transformative these words from the Bible really are. Today we will explore what the Bible teaches about putting God's perfect love into practice and working through conflict with our brothers and sisters who are on this Christian journey with us. The church, we the church, have an opportunity perhaps more today than at any other time prior to this to make Jesus known to a world beset with troubles and destructive conflict. And this is our high calling as believers, to know Christ and make him known. Jesus, in response to a question as to which is the greatest commandment in the law, says this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And its corollary, love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 
these teachings, one right next to the other, show us that the measure of our fellowship with God is the quality of relationship with our brothers and sisters. Hear me well. The greatest measure of our fellowship with God is the quality of relationship with our brothers and sisters, with those closest to us. In the book of John, we read, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And how did Jesus love? Last week, we explored denying ourselves, picking up our cross, and following him as the entry point to the Christian journey. Humility. It's not about me, my rights, my will, my way, but rather letting go of that hard, unyielding self to move through life in full trust that God is good, come what may, and God is working a plan through my life in covenantal grace. No matter how bleak our outward circumstances may seem, God is always good. In his humanity, Jesus offers the example of this perfect trust in the Father's goodness, displaying God's divinity through his human brokenness, carrying out the Father's will to reveal love to its fullest extent, right into death and beyond, to resurrection. Jesus' obedience in this regard reveals that love is, indeed, more powerful than the grave. So for us, however cloudy it is right now, God is always faithful and Jesus is always victorious. His victory, however, is not how victory looks in earthly terms, as we explored a couple of weeks ago, where it's so often a zero-sum gain. If I win, you lose. You win, I lose. Within the kingdom of God or Jesus' reign as Messiah, we look to live into something far greater, far more beautiful, where God's love is made tangible in ways that bless all who receive it, know it, and rejoice in it to their transformation and newness of life. Our text from Matthew this week states, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. And then there is laid out a whole process for settling disputes. Pointing out another one's fault is delicate work. But as folks who have professed Jesus as our Lord and endeavor to let perfect love guide every dimension of our lives, we can do nothing less. Accountability is inevitable as we, imperfect humans, walk together in trust before a perfectly loving and patient God, as we see God manifest in the life and spirit of Christ. And in this context, accountability is an act of love, born of a desire for the very best for the one who has strayed from love's path. I wonder, for some of you, if you have a hard time with the language I just used, that of Jesus is Lord. I know I did for a long time. In our day, the word Lord is loaded with all kinds of baggage. Perhaps for you it's heavy with patriarchal or even class assumptions. Or the word Lord rings with all too familiar phrases like, because I said so, and maybe even do as I say, not as I do. Or any number of the many ways that authority gets expressed in unloving and painful ways in the world's terms. Don't lord your opinion over me. The word lord can be very hurtful and unhelpful for some. So let's look briefly at the lordship of Christ in terms the Bible sets forth for us to then discuss conflict with our fellow humans. And before we think about going to our brother or sister with a complaint about their conduct, Let's consider how Jesus understands and expresses lordship in the Bible's stories. From Matthew 20:25 20, to 28, we read, "But Jesus called to them 
called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus' authority, his lordship, is made clear in service and sacrificial love. The book The Calvary Road will guide us again this week in our consideration of these ideas. In Colossians 3.15, we read, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. The word rule might grate on us in similar ways to Lord, but in the original Greek, the word here translated as to rule is to be an umpire or referee. In our journey with Christ, the peace of our hearts is to be the referee in our hearts. We all know what happens in football, basketball, or soccer when the referee, who is supposed to be impartial, <laughs> blows the whistle. It's time to stop play, identify the infraction, regroup, and apply the requisite penalty to resume fair play, which often means giving one team a gain or loss in yardage, or, depending on the game, a free kick or a free throw. In our relationship with God, when we find that the perfect peace of Christ has somehow been disturbed, we can understand that to mean that the referee has blown the whistle. It's time to stop play, meaning slow down, breathe, pray, and ask God about where the perfect peace of Christ was disrupted and why. Generally, the infraction to carry our sports metaphor is either with God or with someone else, and often it's with both. Something needs to be addressed between us and God. Here, our Methodist heritage can remind us of the class meetings among the early adherents of the Wesleyan movement, where the first question they asked one another when they gathered was, how is it with your soul? And the participants would confess those sins that God had brought to their attention over the course of the week. And this confession, one to another, before God, was a joyous occasion, since the brothers and sisters could then enjoy the purity of a clean conscience in their fellowship, free in their interactions, and cleansed by Jesus' blood. Jesus, whose love was secure and whose forgiveness assured, not only in word, but in the lived experience and deeds of his followers. First John, John chapter 1, 5 through 10 reads, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. God loves both us and our brother or sister perfectly. So often when we experience painful things at the hands of our brothers or sisters, we are not inclined to express or live out of that perfect love from that point on. Jesus, however, laid down his life to display this perfect love of God. And this is the part that is so compelling about the Lordship of Christ in our hearts, a reign which is rooted and grounded in love. If we are out of step with perfect love, not only will our peace with God be impacted, 
But there is something between us and God that the Spirit of God is calling us to address. I would like to use myself as an example here, but maybe not in the way you're thinking. Here, I'll be describing my journey with Christ as the one confronted in my sin. I have a companion in Christ who has walked a good part of life's path with me, who has endured quite a bit of me, and who knows me in some ways, I would say, probably even better than I know myself. This person was following the course of action laid out here in Matthew 18. If a brother or sister sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. But I did not want to hear it. I didn't like the, wor the way the words came across, didn't like the tone of voice of the one bearing the message. I felt disrespected and misunderstood, felt I didn't deserve to be spoken to that way. Never mind the glaring sin that was causing this person pain, or even the pain it was causing. I was too caught up in the way it was brought to my attention that I refused to hear anything else. In preparation for last week's message, however, I found myself turning Matthew's words over and over in my mind again and again, where he quotes Jesus as saying to the disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Well, I want to follow Jesus, but deny myself? Yes, says the Bible. And in so doing, follow Christ. Christ renounces every right he has to earthly glory, taking on the form of a slave to display the radically self-emptying extravagantly humble, self-effacing love of God. In considering my response to this confrontation, I could see so clearly, clearly that I was a long way from Christ. And there were so many layers to it as I went before God about it in prayer. Pride, self-justification, judging the other person for being unloving, that last one was the plank in my own eye that most prevented me from seeing anything. And we still hadn't even reached the sin that was causing this person pain, my sin. But speaking with all of you this way each week has a powerful way of bringing me to the breaking point. You see, I really want to live out this Christian life. And when preaching last week's sermon on self-denial, on brokenness before God and others, I was preaching to myself to a large extent. To understand the perfect love of God, I must deny myself, must die to those thoughts and attitudes that, seem, that seek to exalt myself, to that inclination to hang out in self-pity and resentment, and the presumption of my own righteousness, or that I don't deserve to be treated a certain way. This is a hard truth to swallow, and it's one that is easily misunderstood or distorted, because I'm not telling you that you have no rights, or that you should endure mistreatment. Taken from anyone but Jesus, this injunction to self-denial can only be some kind of manipulation. But then we see Jesus, who walked this very path himself and expected nothing le less of his followers and called it the only truly victorious life. Okay, I thought, what does denying my rights mean in this context? I have no rights. Suddenly, not only was the sin in question laid bare, which my companion had long been seeking to bring to my attention, but a whole, hell, whole host of other unloving, judgmental, self-centered, self-exalting attitudes came to light as well. When I understood that I had no rights, just as Jesus had let go of his, there came with a piercing clarity from the Holy Spirit that I had a lot more to confess than the original thing brought before me. And I could begin to see that it was God's perfect love working through the other person to bring all of this to light. After talking about it, 
we are walking in a new freedom that hadn't been there before. To a large extent because of all the walls of self I had built up to defend my rights. I have the sense that there be, may be more layers to work through. <laughs> we are all works in progress, but God. Brothers and sisters, beloved in Christ, all this is to say our fellowship with one another is precious and expectant with the promise of Christ. Here within us, among us, in our daily tasks, in our work and leisure, in our Zoom meetings, in our socially distanced reunion as a church, and our planned greetings for the weeks to come, we are all offered the promise of newness of life in Christ. But it is a walk of humility, of brokenness, of trust in God's unfailing love as we, dis as we see displayed in our Lord. So I'll close in asking you, this week, how can you demonstrate the sacrificial, self-emptying love of Christ to those around you, to, to those closest to you, to those maybe whom you don't even like? And remember, while it may be counterintuitive, letting go of your claim to your rights, in other words, to your self-centeredness, may just be the way to freedom and new life. I'm speaking here as one who has received correction and discipline in this particular area, in all humility of heart and earnest appeal for what truly heals and restores. Christ's way is the way to true freedom. When I'm trying to assert my way, assert my will, to claim those rights, I get caught up in that, and I'm, I'm thinking about that more than I'm thinking about what is displaying the perfect love of Christ. To let go of that right suddenly is to open up to a new expanse where I no longer have to worry. I no longer have to assert that demand and my mind is freed to love. It's a commitment. It's a sacrifice. It's determination in the moment to entrust our life to Christ by faith, to God's everlasting goodness. Hallelujah. Amen. I'd invite you now to join nope, that's that's next um, please join in prayer as we receive gifts and remember the giver
Dear God, as we as a body give our tithes, our offerings, we express this as ones who have received your grace, your pardon, knowing that every good gift comes from you. Use us, Lord, in humility, in courage, in strength to proclaim your goodness to a fractured and broken world that your eternal love which conquers death might be made clear, might be made manifest among us in Jesus' holy and glorious name. Amen. And as hopefully you saw in the program that went out last night, uh, we will be sharing in the Lord's Supper. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, God, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit on the night in which he gave himself up for us. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on those joining us virtually. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ.
that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Please join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Dear God, as we who are gathered, this reduced team, as we move on from here, may each of us go under your blessing, renewed and transformed and healed by your perfect love in the knowledge that you will never fail, have never failed. And Lord, may all those who are online and are taking part virtually as they move on from their screen onto the next thing, may they go in your blessing in courage and strength. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may the light of Christ cover you, restore you, protect you, heal you, and lead you into all truth that you may go and be a light to all those you meet. Thank you, God. Amen. <laughs>